Starting off strong with a character that doesn't work as well on the screen as he does on the page, MODOK. As you may or may not know, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania came out pretty recently, just over a year ago. That's a decent chunk of time and yet my nightmares are still haunted by live action MODOK. To be fair, that is what the character looks like. It just looks and feels considerably less weird when you read it on a comic page and not see a warped human face on a 30 foot screen. The actor was doing his best but the odds were against him. The MCU also chose to make the MODOK bald, which is quite interesting considering he is usually drawn with hair. Not always, but lots of versions have a full head of hair. I'm sure Marvel tried the hair, which indicates that the hair was likely even worse, so I guess thank you Marvel for saving us from that. Director James Gunn is taking on a new Superman movie, much to the excitement of fans everywhere. However, that excitement dwindled for some when Gunn posted a sneak peek of Superman's new suit. In a May 6th post to the director's Instagram, you can see new Superman, David Corrin's suiting up to deal with a new threat. The costume is not that different from other versions, they just took the iconic suit and made it more modern and detailed. Now the actor for the hero does have some tough shoes to fill, Henry Cavill is a fan of favorite Superman for good reason. There are some people that just hate the costume though, some saying it literally doesn't fit the actor, that it's super baggy. The suit is pretty banged up, which some people are taking issue with. Other fans like that the suit fits the actor a bit baggy when he's sitting down, one person commenting, Finally, a Superman who has a suit that doesn't look like body paint, love it. But the major change fans think they see, some people can't believe are back in a good way, are Superman's red trunks. I know this suit is controversial though, so let me know what you think in the comment section down below. I can't believe a space Spider-Man exists, but to be crystal clear, I love it. Star Spider is the hero. She debuted in April of this year in Edge of Spider-Verse Volume 4, Issue 3. Her civilian name is Persephone Parker and she is from Earth's 1978, but is currently living on a space station. She is a quantum engineering apprentice, so she is working up there, and also working as a spider hero. Her costume is pretty cool if I do say so myself. It's made up of nanobots that Persephone can communicate with. The bots are called the Sanitation, Planning, Integrated Defense and Engineering Robots, or Spider Robots. They move around Persephone's body to create a suit capable of keeping her safe while she fights in the vacuum of space. It keeps the basic design elements of a usual spider suit spider emblem in the middle and red and blue, but the spider design looks like it's made of neon so she literally glows. The suit also looks super sturdy like it will actually protect her and it's not just there to look cute. Do superhero costumes apply to cars? I think so and so I am going to include the kids cartoon series Bat Wheels on this list because I am very confused. I suppose the idea makes some sense considering the success of Disney's cars. It just looks like a fever dream. The basic rundown of the show is the various cars of the Bat family are brought to life by the Bat computer to fight crime in the disaster that is Gotham City. In this world, Gotham has gotten so bad they need an extra Bat team of crime fighting cars. The team is led by the Batmobile, of course, sometimes referred to as BAM in this universe. The cars do face off against other cars, typically just like the car version of major Bat villains. There is a random helicopter in there though. I don't know if my Sunday will be spent watching this, but it seems like great fun for anyone with littles. Okay, I will admit that this point is from about seven years ago, but that's like nothing in Marvel time, and also it's so stupid I have to bring it up. Ben Riley's Mouth Spider-Man costume from 2017's Ben Riley the Scarlet Spider series. Who did that? He looks like an emoji. There was lots of backlash when the mouth costume was teased, so much so that Marvel announced it would be changed by the third issue. It was too late to change one and two. Other than the mouth, the costume is great. Some fans even consider it to be their favorite Ben look. The mouth is just... So silly though. I never expected to see a combination of Nightcrawler and Wolverine, but I am absolutely not upset about it. Wagnerine is her name and her game has changed a few times. She was initially hired to off people and was a little evil in her heart until the scream of change was used on her and then she turned into a good guy. She is literally Nightcrawler, Wolverine, DNAs mashed up together. Her look is a really good mix of both heroes. She has the red part of Nightcrawler's look and the weird feet. I know that Nightcrawler is not a human, but the two toes makes me uncomfortable, so you know what, I can't believe they are still using it. Wagnerine 
has the wolverine claws and cowl. The most aggressive combination of the two characters has to be Wagnerine's nightcrawler tail with a wolverine claw on it. Lots of recent Batmans have worn a black suit, especially in movies. But the character started out with a grey suit and it looks like the bat will be heading back to his roots with the latest redesign. The new suit will debut in 2024 as Batman 148 when Batman faces off against his evil alter ego Zur NR. It's no secret that DC likes to write some stories with darker themes nowadays, so it makes sense that the characters outfits get darker as well. But now Batman is lightening up a bit in the costume department and only there. The new suit is going to be grey with dark blue accents and it has the classic yellow utility belt. What I can't believe with this look is how big the bat in the middle is. I know it seems like such a silly thing to notice, but like the bat is huge. It takes up his whole upper chest. We know you're Batman, we get it. It could just be perspective, but I don't think so. I guess we will have to find out soon when the comic comes out on June 4th. About this time last year, Marvel dropped a version of Venom that is so cool I can't believe he exists. Samurai Venom exists out there in the Venomverse, in the way that there's like thousands of Spider-Mans in the Spider-Verse, there is just as many Venoms in the Venomverse. Take Moto Tatsaya became Samurai Venom when he picked up a black katana. It was infected with the symbiote Venom, of course. At first, Tatsuya resisted Venom because Venom can be a bit violent and uncontrollable, but after an encounter with the Scorpion, he is singing a very different tune. Sometimes Venom is the answer. It's still a rough relationship, always a fight for control, but Take Moto is hopeful that the two can eventually coexist. It truly Really is a mix of traditional samurai armor and the Venom look. Overall, I would say the armor on him is slimmer than what you would typically see when it comes to samurai armor, but it's still got the general outline and plates and belts. Time to look at another version of Spider-Man, and this one dresses like Cyclops stole his whole flow. So this Peter is from Earth 72 and also debuted in the new volume of the Edge of Spider-Verse series, but issue one this time. In this world, Peter has had his mind erased by Department H. Department H takes soldiers and messes with them genetically. It's unclear if Spider-Man got his powers from the experiments or the traditional spider bite in this universe. Peter doesn't know his name at the start of his story. He is known as Weapon 8 and the short story is focused on Peter learning his name and getting a piece of his identity back. This Peter is quite powerful. He managed to defeat and kidnap the Wolverine of that Earth and off Captain America of that Earth quite easily, I might add. Now the reason it was easy is likely due to some extra pieces that Peter has. The experience Experiments gave Peter extra eyes and arms. And what I couldn't believe when I first saw the arms is that they are not robot arms like one would hope, they are actually spider claw looking arms covered in skin, so they are actually part of Peter's body. Peter's extra eyes are also quite unsettling in the way only a human with eight eyes can be. The reason I say that Peter's costume looks like Cyclops is because it kind of does. The suit is blue and yellow, which now with X-Men 97 out, we are seeing a lot of blue and yellow Scott Summers. Then there's the glasses. Cyclops famously has his visor to control his optic blasts, and the visor is red. Peter's glasses remind me of that because they are also red and yellow. Unclear why they picked red for Peter though. He just looks like Cyclops and I will die on that hill. This is maybe the most recent kind of costume announcement. It happened May 25th. Okay, for months now, years, however long Taylor Swift has been friends with Ryan Reynolds, there have been rumors of her joining the MCU or Marvel Entertainment as a whole. Dazzler was the long running theory, then it was rumored the singer would take on a show in the role of Blonde Phantom, but Marvel has just posted a new picture of the music mutant known as Magic, and the resemblance is uncanny, uncanny X-Men if you will. This slightly redesigned character really looks like Taylor Swift. So while her outfit has not changed much, if at all, her face definitely has people taking a second look. As one Instagram user did point out though, you can see the mutant's belly button, and as Taylor Swift fans know, Swift does not show hers often, it's an inside joke. The rumors that Taylor is joining Deadpool and Wolverine are still going strong, and the real surprise at this point is just who Taylor might play. Three months Months ago, Marvel dropped a brand new villain. His name is The Planter. He debuted in Miss Marvel Mutant Menace 1. The Planter looks a little bit like the mascot for Green Giant Green Beans, but I think that might just be because of the leaves and green skin. The Planter is a mutant on Earth 616, and he takes on the qualities of any plant he's ever touched. He touches a rose, for example, he would grow thorns. The Planter decides to use his mutant abilities to rob jewelry stores across Jersey City. As he is leaving one store, he states that his rob are a victimless crime because jewelry stores have insurance. Anyways, you know helicopter seeds. As the planter is making his escape, he grows.
throws a huge helicopter seed on his back to fly out of there. It looks ridiculous, but it works. It's hinted that the planter has the potential to join the good side, but the comic is still coming out, so we will have to wait and see. I didn't know I needed punk aesthetic lizard in my life until now. February's spider punk arms race gave us the gift of punk lizard. Of all the characters I would have guessed to be into music and end up dressing like a rock star, lizard wouldn't have even made the top 10, yet here we are. The lizard of Earth 138 is in a band of reptiles. Their band is working to get a record deal, but it's tough. They are willing to do anything to get it though. Vulture preys on this and tells the lizard band that if they could mess up the spider band, they would get a record deal. The lizards head off to do just that, only they end up getting kicked to the curb by our spider heroes. Lizard here wears a black leather jacket and he has spiky black hair on his head and it kind of looks like a mohawk, which is absolutely iconic. You ever look at a villain and go, yeah, you named yourself appropriately? Well, that was me looking at Terror. The newer version of him is from Earth 2099 that debuted a few months ago in Timeless Volume 3 and then in Miguel O'Hara's Spider-Man 2099-4. The character of Terror has been around since 1988, but there's a new version in town and he looks awful. Uh, also, his name might be Shrek, which I think is hilarious. Terror's thing is he was cursed to look like a demon with green skin and decaying limbs. Since his body is always decaying, he needs to replace his parts frequently, so he has the ability to merge other people's limbs into his own body like a self-made Frankenstein's monster. The version of him that debuted a few months ago is the scariest of the ones I've seen. He looks like he steals people's parts because he is falling apart. He actually has a whole operation for it in this world. He opened the body shop and it's not a place for lotions or soap. It's a place where bad people get lured so Terror can keep their body pieces. Terror was ultimately driven away from his shop by Spider-Man to hide in the sewers. Maxwell Markham aka Grizzly originally debuted in 1974 but a new version of him dropped literally a few weeks ago and he's kind of fabulous. The new version debuted in Spider-Man Unlimited Infinity Comic 37. The first half of the comic is Earth 616. It's normal Spider-Man fighting against the normal Grizzly, so we see what Grizzly normally looks like. A strong man in a Grizzly bear suit. Most, if not all, depictions of Grizzly up until this point were a man in a bear suit or wearing a bear skin or fur in some way. The new Grizzly is a different kind of bear. He is still a strong guy, and I'm sure he still wears that Grizzly bear suit every once in a while, but on Earth 71,490, he is not just a criminal, he is the criminal, New York's kingpin of crime. Not much is known about him considering he literally just dropped on like May 14th, but we can assume his story is similar to his 616 counterpart. He's shown in his human look with what I'm assuming are some adamantium or gold claws, which makes sense, but he also has presumably the same metal as a beard. I mean, he probably wears it because his like jaw was busted or something, but I like to think that he just chose to make himself a beard out of some of the most rare metals on earth strictly for the aesthetic. You've heard of the Sinister Six, well get ready for the Sinister Six. They are the same, but different, and also scarier. Already, the idea of going up against six of your worst enemies at once sounds awful, but it can get worse. The Sinister Six exist on Earth 9349. This universe has a lot of cybernetic implants going on. They are super popular. The Spider-Man of this Earth has them, but unfortunately, so do the Sinister Six. That's why they are called the Sinister Six. So now you have all these villains that were already hard to subdue when they were normal, tricked out with cybernetic implants that make it even harder to take them down. In the comic, Spider-Man says he got his implants because he had some really bad injuries, but it's also implied that the villains were getting the implants first, which probably made it next to impossible for Spidey to win in a fight against them. Even though the villains are a bigger problem now than ever before, they also look cooler now than they ever did before. I know, I can't believe it either. On this upgraded villain squad, we have Electro, the Living Circuit, Cyber Goblin, Silicon Man, who is Sandman, Mysterio, but it's spelled Mystery Zero, Steel Vulture and Dr. Octoplex. For the most part, everyone looks like just like a robot cosplay of themselves. The only outliers are Mysterio and Doc Ock. Mysterio is just his crystal ball head with some disturbing little tentacles and pretty much the same goes for Doc Ock. Half his torso and his head and all those tentacles. Spider-Man's cybernetic implants ended up being the only reason he made it out alive from the fight with all these guys. When he got the implants, he also received an operating system named Webby. Spider-Man is trapped by the villains and seconds away away from death when suddenly all the villains' cybernetics stop working. Turns out Webby was able to hack them and shut them down, leaving an opening for Spider-Man to get away. So far, the Sinister Six have only appeared in March of 2024's Edge of Spider-Verse Volume 4, but hopefully we'll revisit them again soon. You've heard of millionaires, you've heard of billionaires, 
get ready for Killionaire, the teen influencer out to ruin your life. Killionaire's power is money, which is not a power to be underestimated. He hires Taskmaster to create a suit for himself with all the powers of all the Avengers. Unfortunately, Taskmaster was only able to build a little toy with the powers of all the Avengers. Still, that soldier was destructive. Killionaire took it on a walk downtown and filmed the toy destroying pretty much everything in its path like billboards and screens and cars. Spider Boy is the one to fight the little toy, eventually convincing it to be a good guy instead. And Killionaire is left with nothing but potential juvie sentence. Killionaire looks like a purple and gold version of Vector from Despicable Me. His haircut is definitely a choice and not one I would have made if I was a super rich kid. Also the combo of the skinny glasses, turtleneck, gold slim jacket and massive gold chain K, it's too much for me, I'm sorry but it's giving Vector. Like father, like daughter, the ringmaster's daughter has stepped into his shoes and put on his hat. The ringmaster look was goofy on her dad and I'm sorry but it looks a little bit goofy on the ringmistress too. Thankfully that is probably the point considering it's the circus. The ringmistress wanted to make herself into a respectable villain so she put on her dad's hypnotism top hat and gathered up a team to create her own version of the circus of crime. Her colors are green and purple like her dad, so green coat covered in black stars with matching boots and then a purple jumpsuit and top hat. The top hat has one of those black and white swirls on it because it's used to hypnotize. This 2024 version of the crime circus had a major debut crime planned. They were going to attempt to rob everyone at a fair by making the ferris wheel into a giant hypnosis device. Did it work? No, of course not. Doctor Strange put a stop to it. The other members of the new circus of crime were Jim Nasty, Stefano Stiletto, and Chief Beef. Who knew adding a zero to the end of 616 would result in the most disturbing Marvel Universe ever created? Earth 6160 is the Earth currently being featured in Ultimate X-Men Volume 2. It's the universe that the maker used time travel to create his perfect world and prevent anybody from becoming a superhero. In this world, we are introduced to this shadow that is like terrorizing this little girl. The shadow's design might be simple, but it is unbelievably unsettling. I think the shadow is also like a real human man too, and he just looks like a guy in that sense. It's the abstract entity side of shadow that gives me the creeps. It's like this black, scratchy line blob thing with veins and red misshapen eyes. I don't like it. I don't like it. The comics are still coming out. The character debuted in March of this year, so we have to wait and see where the shadow ends up. Is Venom a hero? Is Venom a villain? It really depends, but Clown Venom did ruin a kid's birthday party, so I think we know what category that puts him in. Cloud Venom debuted in August of last year in Edge of Venomverse Unlimited Infinity Comic 8. The clown was a regular birthday entertainer that happened to be bonded to a symbiote. The kids at the party were being really annoying, and that caused the clown to get so frustrated he accidentally let his sim loose. This caused pretty much every child to run for their mom. Carnage eventually showed up to make everything worse and take out Clown Venom. Clown Venom used a variety of silly tactics to confuse and I guess fight Carnage, like turning his tentacles into balloon animals and making himself a pinata. Unfortunately, Carnage did win and the clown's noggin ended up as a birthday present. The Venom Clown is allegedly supposed to be a parody of Pennywise and though it was pretty ridiculous, it was also pretty fun. We now have a new demigod villain who is drenched in the sweat of Theseus and has an enchanted bag that blows air. I wish I was kidding, but I'm not. Zip Zephyr debuted in February of this year in Miles Morales Spider-Man 17. Miles, Miss Marvel, and Shift were fighting this guy in Brooklyn and I think he was just there to cause problems. Like we get thrown into the middle of the fight pretty much so it's unclear why Zip is causing all these problems. Zip is presumably from ancient Greece or is Greek because he says he bathed in the sweat of Theseus which made him really slippery. Because he is slippery he moves really fast because he's literally slipping through the wind and also spider webs they don't stick to him. The other thing Zip has going for him is his bag. It blows air. Powerful bursts of air. I think Miles best summed up everyone's feelings about this when he said, a bag of wind? What is even going on right now? Zip gets KO'd by Shift and presumably arrested. No amount of Theseus' sweat is going to help him slip out of that one. You know, a lot of suits of armor do all these crazy cool things like being actually alive or adapting wishes or traversing the vacuum of space, but not for our first suit of the day, the Muramasa armor. Essentially, it had one main benefit, but despite that, it's probably the coolest armor I have ever 
seen. In the all new Wolverine series, X-23 gets her hands on this special suit of armor called the Muramasa armor. The word Muramasa may be familiar to you if you are a fan of Wolverine comics. The Muramasa blade was forged by the legendary swordsmith Muramasa by using a piece of Wolverine's own soul. It's the second blade made by Muramasa and it's extremely durable and capable of cutting through substances on the molecular level, even adamantium. More than that though, the sword is also capable of greatly reducing the efficiency of a superhumanly fast healing rate, meaning that the sword is the only thing on earth that can truly end the life of Wolverine or others like him. Well, this armor was made for Laura Kinney in order to protect from the broken Muramasa blade fragments that were being used against her. But other than its absolutely amazing look, the coolest thing about this armor is that it's made with soul fragments of Wolverine, Gabby, and Dokken. This thing basically became a Wolverine family heirloom. Now while the Muramasa armor is just absolutely awesome, this next suit is just straight up nonsensical. But that is why we love it. Tony Stark's virtual armor, or the Model 68, is probably the most unique of all of Iron Man's armors. The virtual suit first debuted in Iron Man 2020, Volume 2, Number 5, when Tony Stark had his consciousness pulled out of his body to save his life, and it resulted in the virtual armor, which was made from the resources of the quote, 13th floor, which is basically a virtual reality built of solid light. Now just to preface, I never said any of this had to make sense. The virtual armor being virtual and made of solid light could allow Tony to create any tool that he could possibly think of. It augmented his strength, it somehow actually protects against weapons fire, and it's invisible by default, acting as almost a force field around Tony that no one can see unless he wants it to be so. What's really cool is how it can separate from Tony to form like a prison bubble around people, and the suit even somehow still allows Tony to fly, and it protects him from the vacuum of space. I have no idea how it works, you have no idea how it works, it's the most comic booky thing I've ever heard of, but let's be honest, it's kind of awesome despite that. But if we are going to talk about one of Iron Man's crazy armors, why not talk about one of Batman's crazy armors? Enter the Hellbat suit in Batman and Robin number 33 by Peter Tomasi and Patrick Gleason. The Hellbat is the Justice League's gift to Batman, which he dons to go to Apocalypse, the homeworld of Darkseid, to try and recover Damian Wayne's body. Now this suit elevates Batman to be able to trade punches with Darkseid himself. It was forged by Superman inside of the sun and was made out of a shifting nanokinetic metallic material that could activate via voice commands. It allows Batman to fly, run at super speed, while also boosting up his strength and durability to ridiculous levels. It comes with adaptive camouflage, a unibeam style energy blast, and a shape-shifting cape that somehow literally turns into bats when it's ripped off, which is the most badass thing I have seen in a hot minute. Now obviously, with all the benefits it grants Batman, it has to have some kind of downside, or there's no reason that Bruce wouldn't just wear it all the time. That downside is that the Hellbat suit slowly drains Bruce Wayne's life force and would actually wipe him out for good if he wore it for too long. Luckily, he only needed it to rescue his son, which he achieved in spectacular fashion. He then rebuilt the armor and kept it on the moon just in case. And of all people, Lois Lane was the only other person to use it to face the Eradicator. But going from one of the coolest suits in comic books to one of my absolute least favorites. When Black Condor first popped up on the scene in DC Comics, his choice of garb was interesting. Richard Gray Jr. gained the power of flight from being exposed to a radioactive meteor, though he believed he had just developed flight naturally after being raised by a flock of condors. I am not joking. So clearly, there is a level of, mm, how do you say, creativity here. Richard came back into society from his time with the Condors. He then took someone else's identity while also being a costumed hero, and I think his superhero costume perfectly exemplifies how utterly off the rocker this guy actually is. Richard took to wearing a cape that draped out under each arm, being attached to his wrists bracelets, giving the semblance of wings because fly. It kind of reminds me of Monica Rambeau's earlier 
warrior costumes, only mm, worse. Now, I'm sure that his underarm cape wing things could probably have had some kind of effect on his flying, but the rest of the getup is a mystery as to why he chose it. Essentially, he wears a neck collar that connects to this big chunky belt with one piece of fabric in the front, and he accompanies that with some short shorts and some really ornate looking boots. And that's it. Thankfully though, later iterations of the character took their look in some much cooler and serious direction. Now in Marvel's Ultimate Universe, Valkyrie is an incredibly capable warrior and is probably one of the strongest members of the Ultimates. But she wasn't always that way. Initially, Barbara Norris was just a 19 year old girl with no actual powers who was obsessed with superheroes, specifically Thor. She did have some martial arts skills though, and she used that skill as a member of the Ultimate Universe Defenders, who were really Really just wannabes. They went off pretending to be superheroes for clout, essentially, until Loki gave them all real powers. She then joined the Ultimates, but all the while she was running around calling herself an Asgardian warrior, Valkyrie initially was pretty scantily clad for most of her appearances. I'm sure there are a group of fans who were all there for that, but for some of us, it just didn't make too much sense. It wasn't until later on, after working with the Ultimates for a little while longer, and having some real training with real Asgardians, that she would begin to armor up to bring her more in keeping with someone who was engaging in incredibly intense armed combat on the daily. But for a good chunk of time, she was jumping into battle extremely unprepared. Maybe coming back from the afterlife taught her armor was useful, but on the plus side, I think the change in her armor over time actually kind of shows her character's growth from a young, kind of out of her depth hero into a powerful warrior. Now switching back to DC Comics here, the history of Catwoman's look is a long and honestly incredibly odd story. Over time, she would go through a number of looks until it eventually became a leather suit, which had a more practical Master Thief vibe matched with a pair of cat eye goggles. And it became the character's most popular costume with later redesigns all primarily retaining the key elements of that suit. But in the very beginning, Selena Kyle was just a woman in a green dress that was also a thief. That kind of checks out for the comics at the time, and it also felt kind of unique in my personal opinion, compared to all the zany villains that were around. She kept it rather low key. All it took was one change to make that no longer the truth. Eventually, in 1940s Batman number three, Selena Kyle donned an orange costume with a cape with the super great addition of an absolutely terrifying full cat face mask. This was basically like a mascot's headpiece, but like a little bit smaller and tighter to her head, which I'm sure made it more practical, but for me, it's utter nightmare fuel. I don't know what it is about animal heads on human people bodies, but I am not here for it. Basically, she kept the dress that she started with, but now, get this, it was orange, with an incredibly high standing collar, and it was combined with a huge reddish orange cape. Tiny little blue heels were also there for added comfort, and she topped it all off with a terrifying full cat head piece. And I am, I don't wanna talk about it anymore, we're moving on. I promise I am not trying to make this a Bat Family centered video, but I think we can kinda all agree that the Bat Family costumes go through so many different changes, from the terrifying early look of Catwoman, to the terrifying in a different way look of Cassandra Kane's Batgirl. Cassandra Kane is the daughter of David Kane and Lady Shiva, two assassins who raised and trained Cassandra to become basically a perfect warrior. She became the new Batgirl in Batman No Man's Land, and her costume was such a drastic change compared to other Batgirls of the past. If I was walking the streets of Gotham and I saw someone dressed like this, I would just move, like to a different city, possibly a different country, maybe even a different continent. Going from the almost friendly seeming outfits of Barbara Gordon Gordon's Batgirl costume to this dark, brooding, leather-clad costume with basically no human facial features that walked right out of someone's nightmares? It's so fitting for her and her character. It's intimidating, it's intense, and if I was a Gotham City criminal who came face to face with this in the middle of the night, my life would flash before my eyes before Cassandra even laid her extremely capable fists on me. Now, when the X-Men were first created, their costumes were basically all just slight variations of the same basic look. Hank McCoy, when he first showed up, was a shorter, stocky guy with huge hands and feet. That was basically it. His original costume didn't even have gloves or boots, which helped him to stand out even even more. Now Hank was the bruiser on the team for sure, with his mutations being strength and agility. But while he may have been a somewhat odd looking guy, he was still fairly human looking. 
that is, until Amazing Adventures number 11 in 1972. Hank got a job at Roxxon, which is never going to go particularly well, what with them being incredibly shady. During his time with Roxxon, Hank developed a serum that acted as a catalyst for activating latent mutations for short periods of time. And then he drank it. The effects of this serum ended up making Hank grow gray fur. Yes, gray, not blue. His muscles expanded even more. His ears became large and pointed. He got claws and his canine teeth grew and became fangs. The serum further increased his superhuman agility, endurance, speed, and strength, as well as enhancing his senses, but it became the basis for how Hank McCoy would look going forward. It wasn't until Amazing Adventures 14 that he would become the blue, furry, awesome beast that we know and love thanks to Quasimodo. He's been the same ever since. Now in for our runner-up spot, in the future timeline where Batman Beyond takes place, before Terry McGinnis came along, Bruce Wayne was well aware that his body was beginning to fail him, which meant that he needed to build a suit capable of making up for his aging body. After pouring his vast resources and knowledge into his creation, the Batman Beyond suit was born. After spending years and years fighting crime in Gotham, this suit is only one of a few bat suits that are actually bulletproof, but it can do way more than just deflect projectiles. The Beyond suit has allowed Terry McGinnis to walk through burning buildings, survive underwater for extended periods of time, and the suit is even resistant to radiation. It features neuromuscular amplification, which has been able to help Terry bend metal bars, lift giant metal eye beams, move large quantities of rubble, and massive light projectiles. Random, but trust me. It's not all physical, but it's not all physical. While Terry had previously been able to hear through thick walls and glass, upgraded version of his suit takes advantage of a system that allows him to literally see straight through walls. This suit literally has a polygraph device in order to tell when villains are lying. The Batman Beyond suit features almost too many things like cameras, voice communicators, retractable claws and wings, an incredible stealth mode, and it's even got lasers, man. But the best part of the whole thing is just being able to look at it. What an icon. Okay, for our last point today, he may have had a mullet at the time, but Superman in a black costume? Come on. After the Man of Steel was resurrected in Superman Volume 2, number 81, after his death at the hands of Doomsday, he came back with an all-black costume with silver accents. I don't know about you guys, and I know a lot of people hate that mullet, but you put any hero in a sleek black version of their normal suit compared to their usual color schemes, and I am there for it. Spider-Man did it, and it was one of his most iconic looks. Superman did it, and lordy lord, he killed it. The costume even got a modern revamp in Zack Snyder's Justice League when Henry Cavill's Superman comes back to life from a very similar doomsday defeat, and it looked even better that time. Sure, black-suited Superman may not have lasted too long, and sure, the red and blue is just way more iconic and symbolic of the character, this costume has a definitive place in my list of absolutely favorite superhero looks along side black suited Spider-Man. Sorry we didn't talk about it. We're starting off simple. Wolverine's blue and yellow suit is iconic. I cannot find fault in that. I am going to complain about yellow later on, but not here. Wolverine as a character is big and aggressive, so yellow works. He's not exactly one for trying to hide in a fight. When he debuted in Incredible Hulk 180, the only non-threatening thing about him were the whiskers. Cat looking whiskers. Even though they were such a small part of the look, they did wonders for making him look less menacing. Thankfully, Literally the next time we see Wolverine in giant size X-Men 1, his costume is basically the same, just no whiskers. There is an in-canon reasoning, there's this whole thing where a villain, Mesmeros, takes over Beast Mind and makes him wear a costume made from different Halloween costumes. In the fight to defeat Mesmero, Wolverine's original mask gets torn up, but he can't go face out, so he instead takes the mask Beast had been using. And must have really liked it, because it's been the look ever since. From an out of universe perspective, the change may have been made for a variety variety of reasons. The original mask showed Wolverine's eyes, whereas the new one didn't, allowing for more mystery which works well with the character. But really, the illustrator of Giant Size X-Men thought Wolverine's original mask looked too similar to Batman, so when Gil Kane drew Wolverine's mask incorrectly on the cover, he liked the change and put it in the pages too. Black Widow's current costume works so well for the character it's hard to imagine she ever had to fight in anything else. She did, and they were not good. Not even like design-wise, sometimes they were just improved 
impractical. The first few Tales of Suspense comics she's in, she's wearing wiggle dresses. I've tried moving in a vintage wiggle dress, just going up the stairs is mission impossible. So she not only needed a redesign to give her a better look, but she also needed one so she could actually fight properly. In Tales of Suspense 64, she does a more practical fighting fit, but it's also not great in my opinion. It's a fully blue suit with a really short cape and fishnet tights. She was basically wearing a Spider-Man suit, it was very similar. The boots let her stick to the ceiling, and she had a bracelet that would shoot a nylon line so she could swing around. In the 1970s, that is when the iconic Black Widow outfit we know today came into the picture, thanks to artist John Romita Sr. I personally think the all black suit works better for her, it makes it easy to sneak around, and fits the image of a Black Widow better than blue. I love Iron Man, so this does hurt a little bit, but we do have to acknowledge that the first ever Iron Man suit wasn't the prettiest. I know that it was built in a cave with a box of scraps, but I think we are all glad that Tony improved on the design when he escaped said cave. Even then, the first official Iron Man suit was pretty clunky and didn't move super well. We didn't even get the iconic red and gold until a few designs later. The first redesign was all gold, because according to Tony's love interest, Marion, the gray is awful and dull, whereas gold would make him seem more like a knight in shining armor. Tony also changed it because the gray apparently is frightening to everyone, friend or foe, but gold will be frightening to just foes. I love the logic of the 60s. Tales of Suspense 48 is when the Iron Man that is popular today makes his first appearance. The gold suit was way too heavy, so Tony redesigned it to be made of lighter material so he could fight better. And the red? Well, in the 48 comic, he is fighting Mr. Doll. Mr. Doll has a doll that he makes look like his opponents. When he hurts the doll, he hurts them. Iron Man adding the red was supposed to prevent that. I love the current Nightwing suit. I think it looks great, it's simple, just black with a blue bat across the front. It's just really nice. The original is iconic though, terrible but iconic. Looking camp right in the eye, you can tell that it was designed in the 80s. The pants aren't that bad, they're just, they're just pants. It's the top. It looks like something Elvis would have worn during his Vegas residency or like an 80s rock star. Not saying that's a bad thing, I just can't imagine having to fight crime in a collar as high as my cheekbones. That has to be blocking his peripheral vision and ability to turn his head. It also has a v-neck that looks great but exposes his chest a bit and that's where your heart is. You should probably protect that king. The mask is fine, that hasn't changed from the first fit to now. While Nightwing does serve in his original fit, the redesign has become his most iconic look and I think he serves fighting crime better in that one. Featured beside the first Nightwing fit, like the next panel over, is the original Jericho suit. Jericho is a villain now, but that wasn't always the case. When we first met his super persona in Tales of Teen Titans 44, um, actually first appeared in 42, but saw the super suit in 44, point is, he was on the good side. It was later that he switched sides. His suit looks like an 80s colorful Thor. He's got a pink, I'm assuming, armored vest chest piece. The belt is massive. It looks like he has a cape, but it's actually a blue hood. At this rate, the Teen Titans will soon be touring the US as the hottest 80s rock stars. I think my biggest issue with the original suit is that it has a very loose white turtleneck. I just, the extra droopy arms are bound to get caught on something. His costume in the Rebirth era kept the white, but made it more form fitting and suitable for crime fighting, in my opinion. The cyborg we are used to seeing now is more machine than man, very modest. He didn't start that way. He first appeared in DC Comics Presents 26, and he is basically wearing a cyborg swimsuit and thigh high boots. Again, with the super v neck, please protect your heart. Even if it is just nuts and bolts. He has the half cyborg face that carries on throughout his redesigns, and he is silver, that doesn't change either. The suit is just so 80s and impractical, I kinda love it. Later depictions of cyborg fill in the gaps of his original suit and add more crime fighting machinery. Out of the three Teen Titans here, his suit is probably the most similar to what he would later become. The X Men Beast is blue. He's been blue for a long time, but not forever. He actually started out as a human looking character that just had really big hands and feet. I suppose that it would have made it easier for him to exist in the human world when he didn't have his signature blue fur, but that also meant that when he dressed as an X-Men, he had no gloves or shoes. Literally, toes out. And I'm sorry, but it looked a little silly. And it wasn't really an iconic look, he's just a guy with big hands. When he takes an experimental chemical that turns him into a furry monster, that's iconic, that 
that's original. And then turning blue, now that's a recognizable hero. I'm not sure if this 100% counts, but I'm gonna do it anyways. When you think of The Flash, probably most people think of Barry Allen and his iconic red suit. Well, Barry was not the first Flash. The first guy to take up the name was Jay Garrick. His suit does have the iconic lightning bolt on a red background, but that's where the similarities end. His pants are blue, but the best, worst part of the getup is the helmet. The character is based on the god Mercury, who wears something super similar. I wasn't around in the 1940s, so I'm not sure how I would have felt seeing it then, but I know how I feel now. It's such an interesting choice, and it doesn't have a chin strap. Wouldn't it fly off? That's a safety hazard. This man runs faster than the speed of light. Getting hit with his flying helmet would take you out for sure. It also just looks a little silly. I think it was a cool idea to base him off Mercury, though. I will say I quite like the Barry Allen flash fit. No possible projectiles from that one. And to me, I just find the solid red to be more cohesive and visually appealing. Daredevil now. Amazing outfit. The original, though, uh, just doesn't make sense. Daredevil can't see, but any villain can see him coming from a mile away. He looks like a hazard sign. The all red is definitely more menacing, practical, and stylish. The reason he was bright yellow and red at first is because that was his dad's boxing robe colors, so the suit was a tribute. It's really sweet, but also really visible. In Daredevil issue one, the suit is hand stitched by Matt out of old shirts and presumably the robe. I think he knows he's using yellow because he says that each colored fabric has a different feel to him. Matt does make a point of noting when the costume is done that Daredevil will be recognized anywhere. Bright yellow can achieve that, so while he's establishing himself in the super scene, the choice is a good one. This outfit does not last long. In issue 7, it's changed to the full red fit we usually see Daredevil wear. The new red suit design is modeled after the way the Christian devil is often depicted, which makes sense to me. The design change was addressed later on in a level with Daredevil section. Turns out, when Wally Wood became the new illustrator, he just didn't like the Daredevil costume and decided to change it. We just talked about Arabian Night a few videos ago, and he fits in here too. Maybe not for the same reasons. See, he desperately needed a redesign because his original concept was a bit racially insensitive. Editor Andy Schmidt is quoted saying the first version of Arabian Night was just a visual stereotype with no real character behind him. The original had a special magic carpet that would only respond to his mental commands, and his weapon was a scimitar. He also had a belt sash that again would only obey his mental commands, so it could be used as binding or a weapon. In the new version, the magic carpet got unraveled and made into a suit for Arabian Night that still gives him all the same powers the carpet had had. The new guy was also given more of a backstory and was designed to be less of an insulting stereotype as described by Schmidt. He is fabulous and deserves attention. His real name is William Talkman. His costume's mask is a working clock. He has this amazing red cape that is lined with fur and a blue 19th century king's jacket and even has a velvet crown on top of his clock head. His hideout is a clock tower and the first crime he commits in Batman Brave and the Bold is robbing the museum of clocks. Not robbing a museum of their clocks, robbing a museum dedicated to clocks. That's amazing. He gets to the robbery on his clock helicopter and doesn't have powers, just clock themed gadgets to mess around with. Clock King has been around for a while. In the 1966 Batman show, he trapped Batman and Robin in an hourglass so they would drown in the sand while he steals Bruce Wayne's collection of antique pocket watches. Later on in the episode, we see him with a very fancy top hat on his head with a little clock inside. In 1960, we see him for the very first time in World's Finest Comics, and he is pulling a look. He still has a clock on his face, but his suit is blue and has clocks all over it like polka dots, and he has a yellow cape, boots, gloves, and hood. The last time we saw Clock King was in 2023 in the animated show Harley Quinn. At this point, his head is a clock, and he's engaged to the Riddler. I need a Met Gala that is villain themed, and I don't mean everyone is wearing black and has a smoky eye. I want people dressing like Clock King and Crazy Quilt. Personally, I'm pulling up his calendar man with 16 costume reveals. Let me know what you're wearing down below. Time to move on to Clock King's brother, at least in the 1966 Batman show they're related. I'm referring to the Mad Hatter. He also has a very niche interest he is determined to steal. If you guessed hats, you're a winner. The one hat he wants most of all is Batman's 
cowl. That causes all the problems you'd expect. No matter what universe the Mad Hatter is in, he is usually wearing all green or all blue. Funny enough, the actor that portrays the Mad Hatter in the 60s show shares a last name with Bruce Wayne. Most variations of him lean into a lot of mismatched and fun prints, some with checkered pants, some with big bow ties with polka dots, and just lots of contrasting colors overall. The Mad Hatter is delusional, but committed. Lots of his crimes are based and themed around the Alice in Wonderland book. He doesn't just like hats, he will also plant mind control devices in them too, so they prove to be as useful as they are stylish. At one point in Detective Comics 510, the Mad Hatter plots to take over Wall Street, the stock market, aim high my friend, and he just has a monkey. It's unclear where it came from. Lewis Carroll did create a famous monkey puzzle, so that may have been the inspiration. More recent versions of the Mad Hatter, like 2015's Batman Arkham Knight and the Gotham TV show, have made the Mad Hatter a bit edgier, wearing darker colors or all black, but I prefer the monkey man. Reinventing a character isn't just something the writers do, sometimes the characters make that choice all on their own. This is the case of Paste Pot Pete, later known as the Trapster. His OG name came from an invention of his, a multi polymer adhesive, or simply put, it's just like really, really sticky glue and sticky paste. The paste was very popular and the guy made a lot of money, but he wanted more. Believing a life of crime would add more green to his pocket, he turned to the dark side. It technically did add a lot of green to his pocket. He wears a fabulous green jumpsuit with a white collar. The details of the fit are a matching purple nightcap and a big purple bow right on his neck. And then of course, his bucket of paste he carries around with his weapon of choice connected. It's something called a paste gun. It's basically an extreme glue gun. Now, he did make a bit of green in the money sense as well. He successfully robbed a bank and even stole a missile, but before he could sell that off, he was bested by the Human Torch. This causes a lifelong rivalry. Pete even runs into Spider-Man later on in Spider-Man Human Torch issue 1. Spider-Man gets a very good laugh out of Pete's name, much to Pete's annoyance. This is actually the reason Pete changed his name. It literally says on panel, that's it, I'm changing my name. And he picked Trapster to sound more menacing. The later versions of his costume of upgraded him from having to carry around the massive paste bucket, and instead it flows through a chest piece. His Trapster version changed up his colors, now red and yellow with a backpack that contains the glue. Polka Dot Man is kind of similar to Spectro that we saw in part 1, but is more of a twister board because he has a white suit covered in multicolored dots. He has a red belt at the waist with a circle in the middle and a red mask over his eyes. The dots on his suit are very special. Each one can transform into a specific weapon or a gadget when he removes it. So he tears off a dot. That's the equivalent of getting punched in the face. Another is a buzzsaw. His suit is electrically powered, but when he can't access the electricity, he resorts to using a baseball bat. His crime planning method is pretty clever. One time he went on a crime spree around Gotham and the points on the map turned out to be a big connect the dots picture of a stick man. I'm not the only person who loved this. It's implied that the citizens of Gotham were also big fans and Polka Dot became a local celebrity, possibly even appearing on local talk shows. He's been featured in Batman the Brave and the Bold, the Lego Batman movie, and the Suicide Squad. The Ringmaster's main power is hypnosis, and he's good at it. I am hypnotized by his outfit. Here's the thing. All the components, when they are separate, look nice. It's just when they get put together that I am raising an eyebrow. He's got these nice purple pants and a matching tie, a green jacket with black stars all over it, a purple top hat with the circle swirly hypnosis thing in it, and green boots with black stars to match. His boots are nice. I would wear them. A statement boot like that is back in style. Ringmaster leads a criminal organization called the Circus of crime. Shocking. The crime is he uses the hypnosis device on his hat to gain control of his audiences and then make them give him all their money. He's fought Spider Man, Daredevil, and the Hulk. In a fight with Spider Man and Daredevil, Spider Man gets hypnotized and put under the Ringmaster's control. It is during this fight that we learn that the way to defeat the Ringmaster's mind control is to just knock his hat off. And from what I can tell in the photos, he doesn't have a chin strap or anything, so he seems pretty easy to stop if you really tried. If I for him, I would just add a chin strap. Up next is the musical mastermind that is Clarinetto. He is part of the parody series The Powerful Pachyderms. Clarinetto initially poses as a music teacher, but he reveals himself to be the former head of the Brotherhood of Evil Musicians. The former job reveal also comes with a costume reveal, of course. He dons a red and purple helmet with two music notes on top, a red band uniform, and matching purple boots and cape. The star of the show, though, is his clarinet, which has the power to control guitar strings when he 
plays it. Similar to Snake Charming, but weirder. Clarinetto was teaching a group of students. He wasn't really teaching them music and more teaching them to be celebrity impersonator fighting squads. He and his impersonators are eventually defeated by the Elephant Squad through a powerful energy blast. This entire issue is so fun, it's so ridiculous, and not meant to be taken seriously. And if I could sit in on any writer's room, it would have been this one. The Doom Patrol comics have produced some interesting characters like Beard Hunter. The first version of Beard Hunter is just a regular guy, as regular as one can be when you're a highly trained hitman. Regular might not be the word for this guy because he is jealous of anyone who can grow a beard and therefore wants to off them and steal their beard. His spoils from the hits are then worn around his waist. He also has a skull on his chest with a beard pinned to it like a brooch. It's a look. Beard Hunter can't grow his own beard as he has a hormone deficiency. Because of the skull detail on his chest, many people think that Beard Hunter is a parody of The Punisher. His original suit from the 1991 comic is all red and he has this army green backpack to hold his weapons. Beard Hunter is featured in the live action Doom Patrol show and this version is somehow even weirder. He has actual superpowers. He is able to find his victims, no matter where they are, by consuming a piece of their beard trimmings. My favorite fact I learned about him in the final pages of his debut comic Doom Patrol 2 number 45, he gets electrocuted on tin foil and it's so bad that he nearly passes out nearly. What makes him actually pass out is when three heavenly visitors come to him and he remembers God has a beard. Batman inspires people on today's list. He has inspired some truly wacky individuals. Signal Man is just another great example. He started out as Phil Cobb, a little guy in terms of Gotham's massive crime scene. He was determined to become a big Batman level problem and he figured the best and easiest way to do so was to have an extremely specific gimmick. Judging from the likes of Batman villains on this list already, he's onto something. Signal Man first debuted in 1957. This version of him has a yellow cape covered in green shapes and symbols. There are moons and swirls and even some stuff from the workplace hazardous materials information system. He wears striped shorts that are very similar to caution tape and the rest of his suit is red. The whole signal idea came from the bat signal and how much of modern society is run by signals in general. There was also a brief period in 1961 where he viewed Signal Man to be a failure so he changed his name to Blue Bowman inspired by the Green Arrow. That didn't work out either and he was sent straight to jail and not seen until 1976 when he made a comeback in Detective Comics 466 back as Signal Man. He is just a guy, he has no superpowers, but he does carry around a knockout gas gun and his belt has tech that can change any signal he encounters. The Highwayman of the US 1 comic series is so interesting. The story may be about intergalactic truckers, but it's hard to ignore the fashion choice that is Demon Cowboy Trucker. To be clear though, I am obsessed. This villain used to be a regular guy Jefferson Archer, brother to the hero of US 1, Ulysses Archer. Jefferson was a trucker on Earth, but as he got older, he wasn't able to drive as long in between sleeping periods, so he was losing out on work to younger drivers. He didn't like this and tried a bunch of different, not always safe, methods of staying awake until he finally just decided to sell his soul to a demon. Which I love the implications of this because he didn't sell his soul to become a billionaire, he sold his soul to work forever, which means he loves his job and I love that for him. The demon took away his capacity for fear and he doesn't need to sleep anymore, but every time he uses the inhuman tactics, he becomes more demonic. The first version of him from the 1983 comic is pretty tame, just a guy in some pants, a sweater, and a long billowing cape. The wilder versions of him come later. In 2009's Ghost Rider Volume 6, he is pictured with a red eye, the other covered by an eye patch. His skin is deathly pale and he is wearing a full fab red and black cowboy ensemble. I actually really like this one and it's what I based my outfit on today. For Doom Patrol villains, it seems like a lot of the characters start out with an unserious, satirical, or just ridiculous premise, and then the writers take that and come up with a serious, genuine backstory to justify the choice. We saw this earlier with Beard Hunter, and we will see it again now with Codpiece. The creator of Codpiece, Rachel Pollock, was asked to do a one-shot for the Doom Patrol series, and she got creative and pulled from a hero, Green Arrow. She said during an interview with Fortress Comics that she was intrigued by the idea of Green Arrow's single quiver holding dozens of different types of arrows, and thought the absurdity of that would make a great pair villain. The adult themes in Doom Patrol then inspired the stroke of genius that was Codpiece, because that is a real accessory that has been used by men for hundreds of years for the same area as Codpiece's weapon. A modern version of a Codpiece that is used nowadays would be sports protective equipment. The rest of Codpiece's outfit is 
pretty normal as far as villain outfits go. It's just the multi-use weapon on his lower half that is wild. The thing has lots of features. Most interesting to me is the retractable boxing gloves. Codpiece's serious backstory to justify him wearing this is one time a girl told him she didn't want to go out with him because he was short. And he is not the sharpest fork in the drawer, so he assumed she must have been talking about something on his lower half. While Spider Armor MK1 might look a lot better today in its modern iteration, initially when it debuted in Web of Spider-Man issue number 100, it looked honestly pretty goofy. It's giving tinfoil vibes to me. Tinfoil armor, which might actually be what it's made out of, at least in part. As Spider-Man refers to it being made out of a material that is known as being pseudo-metallic, which sounds like it's not really made out of any true steel or like any other real metal. Pseudo means imitation, basically, something that's not genuine, and metallic just means, um, resembling metal, so I'm I'm not surprised this suit was initially shattered in its first incarnation. Rest in peace, pseudo-metallic, aka tinfoil suit. Pretty sure it's tinfoil. Pretty sure. What is happening with some of these suits in Spider-Man 2? I just, I really want to like the hair poking out here, and honestly, I do love that Miles' hair is dyed red for this look, but at the same time, why does it look like the suit is just perfectly cut and molded still. Like it looks like someone went in, in Photoshop, right? And they had the full mask, they had the full head. They literally removed the top of the mask, the top of his head. The lines are just too sharp and the mask does not look like it is properly formed to his head. It literally looks like he's wearing Lego hair a little bit. But aside from the hair rant, which let's be honest, I'm that's most of my point here and I'm, I'm gonna talk about it probably again, to be honest with you. I, I'm not sure how I feel about this look when it comes to just even the shoes. Why are the shoes always throwing me off with Miles's look? I mean, a lot of the times I get stuck on the shoes. This is Miles Morales's Red Spectre suit, by the way, from Spider-Man 2 on PlayStation. And I just, I don't know how I feel about it. Other than I think I just, I simply don't like it. I want to like it, but I just can't. Just what is even going on in Spider-Man right now in the comics? What is happening? Someone help me. Part of me wants to read and like find out and then the other part of me is honestly a little too scared to read and find out. I'm a little nervous. This new suit of Peter's though, an amazing Spider-Man, which will make its first appearance in ASM issue number 53 this summer or just before, presumably, based on the cover for issue number 53 and honestly there's a cover I think it's for issue 52. It's like the costume is teased, but then issue 53 we already have the cover for, so I don't know. This costume though, it seems to give us a sense at least for some of the story behind it. And I'm not sure that I like it. The solicit for this issue also gives me more details that I'm not sure how I feel about. The solicit reads, Peter Parker is the spider goblin. Peter Parker carries the weight of Norman Osborn's sins and takes to the skies as spider goblin. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. How do I feel about this? How do you feel about this? Ugh, this one just feels kind of garish to me. Now I understand what it's trying to do. I kind of respect what it's trying to do, but like the suit that we just touched upon, this one just feels a bit too showy for my taste. I'm gonna be real. We're talking here about Peter Parker's smoke and mirrors suit. This suit design is of course based off of the famous Spider-Man villain Mysterio's look, but what works for Mysterio doesn't necessarily work for our friendly neighborhood Spider-Man in terms of style, in my opinion. The glass smoky helmet really throws me off with this one too, is every time I look at it, it just makes me feel like super detached from the character. I keep forgetting that it's like an actual head. I keep being like, oh, why can't I, like why isn't Peter wearing it though? I mean, where where is Spider-Man's face here also? Even with him being in it, how does he see? Style one, in terms of color, being mainly white with uh, sort of black and gold accents, just makes me straight up think of the White Ranger from Power Rangers. Now granted, I like Power Rangers, okay? But I just, I don't need to be reminded of the Power Rangers when I'm playing a Spider-Man game. To me, that feels kind of weird. I will say the problems this suit has are kind of the opposite of the next one on our list though, which is gonna go in a bad way in a totally different direction. This suit being inspired by the Miles Morales The End comic doesn't make it any better in my opinion. It works better in the comic in terms of what it represents, but on its own, it isn't really cool enough to spark love for this look just deep within myself on style alone. The End comics are basically multi Universal and hypothetical ending stories for our heroes if you've had not gotten into them before. Some of these stories are good, some of them are bad, and some of them are just like kind of meh. 
For me, Miles' is The End was just kinda meh. This look also evokes a similar vibe for me. It's kind of meh. In the comic, at least we get to see an older Miles don the suit, but even then, it's just a pretty basic look. Camo pants over Miles' black and red spider suit with black and red matching boots and a hooded leather jacket. I just wish there was a bit more to it as it feels like a little too casual for my tastes, but I don't know, maybe when you get older, you're like, time to get more casual in my superhero attire. Simply put, there are too many lines for me when it comes to this suit and its look. It's just a lot of a lot. We're talking here about the Secret War Spider-Man suit that appears in the Spider-Man 2 PlayStation game. Now I do like the colors, the blue and black anyways, but I'm not sure how I feel about those red lines though even, like, I don't know. One of the few suits from Miles where everyone else's issues with it is not my issue with it. When it comes to the Evolved suit from Spider-Man 2 for PlayStation, a lot of people out there take issue with the branded Adidas sneakers. Now a lot of people were not happy with these, feeling that Miles' appearance and sweet kicks in the game were made to target a teenage audience, and that offended people. <laughs> for some reason. Something many fans felt didn't really exist for these games, I guess. They were like, there is no teen audience, how dare they? And they thought, therefore, it was silly. Although, to be honest, I know people of all ages who love Spider-Man. I think that his shoe choice is actually less about targeting teens, in my opinion, and it's just more about reflecting kind of like Miles' style. And while normally I'm not a fan of a superhero sneaker look, even with Miles, I think in this case, Miles actually pulls it off with this suit. Now, my issue here, though, is once again, the hair poking out of the top. Like I said, I don't mind the hair itself. I actually think that's a cool style choice, but just the way it looks, like there's something off about the way they did it. It looks like the top of the mask was clean cut away and it's like stiff. Or like Miles' head is weirdly blocky. If it's a spandex style mask, shouldn't the part where it's open like squeeze tightly to the top of Miles' head and then the hair comes out of that? It feels like it should just be a little bit more rounded there and yet it's just like weirdly stiff and straight at the part where the mask meets the hair. I don't like that. I've talked about this next look before on the channel, and of course, as it was a look created to coincide with and celebrate Miles' 10th anniversary as a character, it appears also in the Spider-Man 2 PlayStation game. As I've said before, and I'll say it again, I'm not a big fan of this look. Chiefly, I think it's like the super tight fitting leggings with just the big oversized hoodie. It's a vibe, but it's just not one that I'm feeling for Miles. Maybe on another character I might like this better, but it just feels like it doesn't really fit here. Aside from that, I'm also just not a big fan of the chonky kind of sneakers and like the long neck of the hoodie which zips up to cover the lower half of Miles's already masked face. I don't know, it rubs me the wrong way. Why are team up comics always the ones with weird outfits for Spider-Man? It's like he teams up and he needs to get a suit to match that comic, to match that team up. In this case, actually, that is exactly what seems to be happening with Spider-Man's cyborg suit, which first appeared in Spider-Man issue number 21. You might even be able to guess which Marvel character he is teaming up with in this issue just by looking at his outfit. Now, if you guessed Deathlock, ding, 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 you would be right. Don't worry though, this cyborg look is just in fact a modified version Version of Spider-Man's suit. He doesn't really get a cybernetic arm to replace his human one. Instead, this is a special metal cast which allows him to maintain the functions of his arm while it heals at an accelerated rate apparently, according to the issue. The Electro-Proof suit is an insulated suit that Spider-Man wears in issue number 425 of Amazing Spider-Man, and it is a wild one. It is a wild suit, and it is also a wild issue if you haven't read it. Now, this was at a time where Electro had beefed himself up in terms of his powers, essentially becoming what he'd describe as an electric god. This is also when Electro had pierced ears, by the way. What a great look. Well, the suit that Peter wears here doesn't look all that great. I am glad that it led me to this issue as I kind of love how just like super 90s this issue is. It led me to a time that I didn't know I needed in my life right now, a time when Spider-Man and X-Man Nate Gray were besties just teaming up in New York, and I'm kind of here for it. In this issue, Spider-Man even kind of saves Nate, although Nate pays him back by saving Spider-Man later on, so don't worry about that. But Nate in his fight against Electro is surprisingly not doing so hot. Yeah, at one point he almost gets like completely KO'd by Electro. It's bizarre. That's just how crazy Electro Electro is in this issue. To help combat the sheer power of his electric touch, Spider-Man gets himself an insulated suit to go over his standard suit, which basically looks like it was made out of patio chair cushions and rubber tubing to me. Which in Peter's defense here could make good last minute insulation materials, to be honest. I don't know. Science. 
maybe. Science? Changeling, I've talked about this mutant a few times. He is the telepathic shifter that pretended to be Professor X. So Professor X could go underground to prepare for an alien invasion, had an identity crisis, decided to be a good guy after getting a cancer diagnosis. Zombie version of him shapeshifted into Elvis to help out She-Hulk in a car chase. Hope that's all ringing a bell. So yeah, normally we talk about his powers, his life story, but today we are talking about his original outfit because what is he wearing? Blue morph suit base, which is fun because the alternate universe version of him is named Morph. Honestly, the body of it all is fine. It's the helmet. What is that? Who made that? Changeling can change the appearance of his costume at will and that's what he picked. I have tried to find the reason he wears this helmet, but the truth is the character isn't that popular so there really isn't much. I did find one hilarious description online. The most interesting thing about you is that ludicrous purple turnip of a hat. Sums it up, methinks. It must have something to do with the fact that he has telepathic powers, but I, for the life of me, cannot figure out what it has to do with that. Sound off in the comments down below if you know what is going on with the purple turnip. Again, with the headpieces for this X-Men, Feral sporting some sky-high hair, or fur. Feral is her name, love that choice. She's completely feral. I don't know how to feel about her hair, fur, though. It's so pointy and so high. <laughs> Somehow she is outdoing the original Wolverine look. Her actual clothing follows a similar style to her hair, having very pointy and high shoulders. I feel like she is in a 80s rock band and has yet to reveal that fact. Feral is like an animal. She has sharp claws and teeth. Her mutation makes her very fast and she has heightened senses. She also has a healing factor, of course, and a tail. The tail is very long and very strong. She can support herself with just the tail should she need to. Her most interesting ability, in my opinion, would have to be intangibility. She gained this ability during her ghost era. Yes, she did die, like most Marvel characters. As a ghost, she could easily pass through things. I showed a picture of Feral to my roommate. First words out of her mouth, what would that look like in 3D? She has a point. How big is the hair in real life? Ava Dara or Warbird is a soldier for the Shi'ar Empire. That means she gets soldier armor because she goes into battle a lot. She is in the army. Not that I really know what going into battle is like, but I watch TV, I read, and you generally want to protect soft parts and major organs in your chest area. Tell me why her entire middle section is completely exposed in a big cross. Nothing there that we can see. Hopefully there's like an invisible shield type of situation she put there to show off, but I really don't think so. Is it a show of power? I'm exposing everything because you will never get close kind of thing? It's poor design in my opinion. Fun design, she looks great, but it's not proper battle armor. The rest of the armor is fine. Her legs, her arm, and her head are good. It's just the heart and major organs that are out. Warbird is a strong fighter, expert markswoman, and very well trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Plus she has an energy sword, so she is equipped to brawl when she needs to. The Cyclops outfit that debuted right after Avengers X-Men in 2012 was not a favorite in comparison to other Cyclops fits. No, it didn't measure up, but it didn't look completely awful, but it was kind of impractical. There are already so many things you just have to ignore in the Marvel Universe, or you just kind of have to take it at face value, or else you'll find no enjoyment here. But this outfit just makes no sense for the character. So usually Cyclops wears a visor to help prevent random like optic blasts. The good thing about the visor is that it makes sense. If he needs to remove it, he can do so easily. It makes sense that something could be built into the visor to prevent the random optic blasts. So when the new fit dropped in 2012, there were a lot of questions. The suit itself is forgettable but fine, just a red suit with lines on it. It's the head section that is weird, again with the helmets and heads and masks. So instead of a visor, he just has an X. X across the eyes. Not sure what the X is made of, presumably fabric, but then what fabric is going to prevent optic blasts? Maybe it's made of a hard material to prevent optic blast, then if he needed to remove it, would he just need to take off his entire hood? Questions everywhere. This one loses points simply for being unrealistic to the universe, which is hard to achieve. Magneto has had a number of outfits over the year, and I have put this one in the middle because I can't decide if I hate it. In 2021, Marvel released a bunch of character designs for the Hellfire Gala. It was the Met Gala for mutants, basically, so everyone is turning up in exaggerated versions of their usual outfits or something representing their powers. Some people hit it out of the park. Emma Frost, Colossus, Sunfire are some of my personal favorites. Magneto's is 
giving. We can't deny that he put his all into his outfit. He's like an Elton John steampunk magneto. There are aspects I really like. His gold cane is his helmet and the suit is fun. It has lots of intricate designs and a rose pin to the collar. Most of my problem, my side eye, is directed at the top hat. I don't think I've seen someone wear a top hat well since like 1900 or a magician. Yeah, I just can't decide if he looks majestic or too over the top. Let me know what you think. Nightcrawler slays right now. He's got a good look going for him. His look in the 90s Excalibur era, not a fan favorite and it's not hard to see why. Nightcrawler now is like this cool guy. Sure, can his red neck cape be drawn a little extreme? Yes, but he makes it look cool. Unfortunately, I can't say the same for his 90s choice of fashion. Lots of characters got bold redesigns in the 90s. Some worked, some didn't. In Nightcrawler's case, they gave him a goatee and overall made him a pirate. He looks like a pirate. Give him the hat, that's a pirate. He has a little gold earring. That's not that bad. I feel like they could bring that back, no problem. His belt is weird though. It looks like it might actually be undergarments. I don't know. The red V that we are used to seeing on the character, but made out of this like loose piece of fabric. It looks like he got into an accident in the sheets section of Bed Bath & Beyond. Generally, fans agree that this redesign was a miss and are glad he has a different fit now. Wolverine's debut costume, the one that was basically the yellow and blue standard but had little whiskers, that one surprisingly isn't the worst thing Wolverine has worn. Maybe the worst thing designed for him, but he has served worse. In X-Men 107, Wolverine is fighting the Shi'ar Imperial Guard. The Imperial Guard wears these outfits that are great for them, sure, but not so great for Wolverine. They are like these brown skin suits with a dark brown stripe up the middle and a belt made out of bones. Sounds like it should slay, right? The thing is, when Wolverine is drawn far away, it looks like he is wearing nothing but a thick ribbon. Physics, we don't know her. He's not, of course. The reason he had to wear the suit in the first place was because he got burned up in the fight and he needed something to wear that wasn't fabric shreds. An Imperial Guard was nearby and Wolverine took him out and wore his clothes. Professor X has sported some looks over the years. This one has got a touch of whimsy, a little bit of magic, and one man looking pretty in pink. Uncanny X-Men 153 gave us the gift of pink wizard Professor X. Unexpected turn for him, of course, but he didn't actually wear it. This issue of Uncanny X-Men featured the X-Men cleaning up after an attack and Colossus's younger sister was scared to sleep because of the attack. So Kitty tells her a story to help her sleep. That story was Kitty's fairy tale. It featured Kitty and Colossus as pirates, Cyclops and Jean Grey as the prince and princess, Storm as the the genie, Nightcrawler as a Banff, Wolverine as an unnamed meanie, and Professor X as the wizard. Professor X as the wizard was a moment. The comic was a little racially insensitive, but not the worst I've seen from Marvel, but also like not amazing. So Pink Professor is sitting on a magic carpet and he's got this hot pink robe covered in white stars and moons. He has a true wizard hat on his head with a little gem right in the middle and a very long mustache. Everyone across the board is sporting slightly goofy looks. This one was just the most shocking to me. So Rogue and the color green are best friends. She looks great in green, but once they made her green, like Shrek green, why? This was in Uncanny X-Men 190 and 191. This story was about that time that New York was transported back to the Middle Ages because a wizard couldn't get tickets to a Renaissance fair. I'm kidding. Kulan Gath is just weird. He made it so everyone in NYC acted like and believed they were in the Middle Ages and dressed like it was the Middle Ages, except Spider-Man. Not about him though. This is about what they did to Rogue. Redheads in green is a moment. You know, with the color wheel, backed science, and everything. So when Rogue wears green, she looks great. When she is green, Green, I don't know. Shrek was not out when this comic was released, but Rogue is Shrek here. She doesn't look awful, but she's looked better. She also just wears a tunic and a long cape. She wasn't always green. In certain panels, she has her regular skin tone, so I'm not sure what's going on. It's kind of funny because at the start of the comic, there is a panel that showcases all the heroes affected by the spell. In it, you can see Storm drawn like a goddess, flattering angles overall, and then Rogue is beside her looking so angry and square? What did they do to my girl? Uncanny X-Men 149 and Kitty Pride match made not in heaven. It is sweet how the costume from this issue came to be. Kitty is young, she wants to express herself, right? So she decided that the X-Men costume given to her was positively antique. So she decided to make herself a new one. This comic came out in the 80s, so I think you can guess how this teenage girl designed an 80s superhero costume and how it turned out. Lots of colors that don't
help go together and some stars. She also added some roller blades to the mix, a nod to Dazzler, who Kitty is a fan of. They are a fun touch. Now instead of the flare coming from her ability to walk through walls, she can roller blade through them. She's got these purple, white, and blue high sock stocking things, and I think a gold base suit. On top of that, she's wearing green shorts, a purple X-Men belt, orange gloves, purple mask, and a red tank top with blue lightning stripes on it. The gloves also have blue stars on them. I was not a teen girl in the 80s personally, so I'm not sure if this was like the dream fit. If you were a teen girl in the 80s, please sound off in the comments. Let me know if you would wear this to the roller.